I want to finish up the podcast with a little bit of talk about YouTube. I think that this is the best end of, of every session, just talking about my general ideas, how I'm interacting with the platform, or I guess video creation in general. I'm not particularly beholden to YouTube, although this is the most convenient platform for uploading. I think I'm just going to talk a brief recap of what happened since the last cast, and then talk about some of the future direction and ideas and plans just so that you're you're informed you being the audience so what's new history of the ban list this is a big endeavor and i like it i've updated some of the graphics they look good of to me i am using some of the original dev pro graphics for that little bit of nostalgia I particularly like the banned and restricted graphics, so they're going to be integrated. I am going to use some of the sound bites and the chain and all sorts of different assets from it going forward. I do think that that is a general improvement to the channel. But to the content of the video, these are fun to make. I exported the last one in 1080p resolution and I edited it in 1080p and I don't think my computer can quite handle that. It was quite exhaustive, and there was quite a lot of lag while editing. Also, there was quite a lot of edits in that every card, uh, every symbol moved around on the screen or shifted, and there was lots of crossfades and different positioning. It was a big project. Of course, the year 2000 was a rather large year for the history of the ban list. Moving forward, I'm enjoying this quite a lot. I think this is going to be a general mainstay of the channel. Expect one every other week or so. That's not a hard promise, but I'm going to work on my best to, to try to get it out with that regularity. Some weeks it might be a struggle because the ban list varies so much. Those biannual lists that we had for a while and those triannual and quadannual lists, they add up. The little tweaks and minor changes, and sometimes there's a lot to say about the individual cards. It's really refreshing to be able to look back at the history of the game, to see what was overpowered, to see Trap Hole on the ban list. That's that's a little interesting. To see Card Destruction, because that's a fun card. Uh, old cards just being at numbers way higher than what we see them now. That's a fun thing to do. I'm looking forward to seeing tempo cards like Green Baboon, Defender of the Forest enter the, the game. Because not everyone remembers, but that was a really strong card at the time. Especially because you could use it on itself. It was empowering to a lot of different strategies and just a good generic card. Also, is that the first hand trap? Like a battle hand trap. I'd have to look up the wording of the card, but I think it is. Because it activates in hand. Of course, we had Karibo, but but I'm not counting Karibo. Karibo was in very, very early part of the game. I like the nostalgia looking at the history of the ban list. I think Cyberstein FTK, or I guess Cyberstein OTK, because you, you, we have a Cyberstein FTK right now, but Cyberstein OTK, that's going to be a particularly special list, and I might bring a crossover episode where History of the Ban List and Yu-Gi-Oh! Nostalgia Month, I incorporate the ban list that I'm most nostalgic for because I remember playing with Cyberstein. I remember pulling off the Cyberstein OTK. I remember constructing a deck with two copies of Chimera Tech Overdragon, Future Fusion, and Overload Fusion. That's going to be a fun ban list, and I'm probably going to show you how certain FTKs worked back in the day. More explanation, but that's time consuming. The other new addition to the channel is Art of Lore. And the first one was a guest upload, but there's now a, a playlist in the Yu-Gi-Oh! section. And it's really fun. It's a little bit harder than other videos to edit. There's quite a lot of movement, uh, different cells move around, a lot of translations, and there's still the fades. 
I'm working with GIMP and getting a little bit better at cutting out the things and the next thumbnail, the one that's, spoiler, Tales of the Undead, is pretty good. I like the thumbnail a lot, but it took more time because I had to cut out all the images to compile together and make the collage. It's good though. It's an experience to have all sorts of different cards. I'm playing around with the title right now. I like the vertical bar and then Art of Lore after the title, but I'm thinking about removing uh, descriptions like the story of Moki Moki and just to write Moki Moki and then Art of Lore, for instance. And of course, I'm moving in the direction of Giga Gaga Giga 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 Giga. I'm, I'm moving towards the story of Gigabyte and his evolved forms, but that's probably going to be a series finale because the story is so big. I do think that I'm going to have a season finale and move up production value in the meantime, shoot a new intro and have a distinct season two break. I do have a plan for what the first season finale is, but... I'm not going to have it right now. Of course, you know about Gagigo, because Gagigo is probably the most famous story in the game. Uh, maybe Marauding Captain. Marauding Captain, they, they go together and make one big story. Uh, future installments, though. They're going to be some obscure ones. Some ones that I particularly fancy, and I'm going to tie in elements that I'm not sure are normal. Like, I'm going to mention things in passing. The Corrupted by the Allure of Darkness is a fun way. In fact, I really enjoy the challenge of incorporating text effects and descriptions in it. That's something that I've been working hard on. To get not just the title of the card, the, the one word, like backfire, into it. Sometimes shuffling the words around, like Chop Man, a Desperate Outlaw or the kick man, trying to incorporate them deliberately, but also some of the effects of the cards, the flavor. That's, that's really interesting. And looking at the art of the game, of course, it's the art of lore, so it's pretty obvious what I'm doing. It's just a different experience. And to tell the truth, it's really refreshing because not all of the game is competitive. I'm not focusing on card advantage, tempo, initiative. I'm not focusing on life points, restrictions, special summon, special summon, special summon, special summon. It's good to be able to engage with the game. And as far as orders of analysis, I would call this zero order analysis, where you're engaging with the game in a way that isn't competitive in the least. And it's good. It's actually a really good feeling to remember. It's the same thing when, when you're taught to analyze a movie, you break it down into the different elements. For instance, I just watched The Bone Collector, and I have very many problems with the movie. The thematic inconsistency, why is this represented? There's an image of a hanged monkey on the cover of the film, and it's featured several times in the movie, so it's not like it's an abstract uh, symbol that is completely devoid of meaning. But... In the context of the film, it doesn't connect to anything. It's just something on the mirror. It could have been replaced by a hula girl on the dashboard and had no change whatsoever. It's just... The point is, when, when you engage your, your slow brain, your thinky-thinky parts, to experience the movie, it's different than when you engage your fast brain, your peripheral emotional responses and you're enjoying the film. I think most people forget that some of the Yu-Gi-Oh game and some of all games is engaging the fast brain, having those emotional responses and being excited. There is a tendency towards the competitive, towards the overly analytical. There is merit to both sides. Zero order analysis, why do you like this card, is, justifi is justification enough. I mean, I like this card, because I like Ojamas. They just have really good artwork. And something interesting happens when you bring them all together. I don't know. In fact, when I pulled Ojamas in the very beginning of the game, two of them are in one set, and then Ojama Green's in another set. So I had yellow and black, and then 
when all three of them come together, something interesting happens. I don't know, like Exodia, maybe? And I really didn't know what Ojama Lime did. Uh, Ojama Green. And even after I got Ojama Green, I didn't know until I pulled Ojama Delta Hurricane. But that's okay. Zero order analysis and any other order of analysis, any other way of interacting with the game is valid. Because after all, the game is designed for you to have a good experience and to have fun. I know this is not directed towards the 1% of my audience that is super competitive, that plays the game to win and fun is an afterthought. But it doesn't have to be. I think the stories are there for everyone. It is a good point to jump into the game because there is a lot of fun with lore. And these should be more universal. I mean, you don't have to describe Nomi and Simi Nomi and missing the timing and chains and structure of turns to people for them to say, oh, Moki Moki, he's a cute little angel, he gets angry, and he gets really strong when he's angry. He has Hulk Syndrome from Desert Punk. I understand. I like Moki Moki. I think that's one of the fun things about the series, is that I get to cater to an audience that isn't really the same audience that I've been catering to with my other videos. I know there's been a little bit of a shift more towards Yu-Gi-Oh! because Yu-Gi-Oh! is where the majority of my play of my view time comes from, and that's okay. I just want to be able to serve the people that want to engage with the game at a high level, thinking rationally, thinking strategically, and enjoying the game in that regard. Not necessarily meta players, but players that want to get better at the game. In fact, I'm going to have a playlist at one point that's just going to be get better at Yu-Gi-Oh, get better at Hearthstone, get better at Magic. Of course, there's going to be some reincorporation of existing concepts, so Card Anatomy is going to be the first three videos in the get better at Yu-Gi-Oh playlist, for instance. Because the first step in getting better at Yu-Gi-Oh is familiarizing yourself with the cards. And then I'm going to go into some basic details about how the phases of the game work. Not particularly detailed, but just enough so that you can understand. Then I'm going to start talking about different concepts in Yu-Gi-Oh. For instance, I already have the orders of analysis as far as Hearthstone. And just folding the orders of analysis videos into a Get Better at Hearthstone playlist makes sense. So first we introduce the different card types. We have a card anatomy episode. Probably just one longer episode because Hearthstone cards aren't nearly as complex as Yu-Gi-Oh cards, or Magic cards for that matter. And I think that there's just several different types. I mean, we have quests, weapons, heroes, minions, and spells. I think that's all the card types in Hearthstone, and most of them are unified under different things. Like, you only have to address mana cost one time. Art is the same, so I'm going to, to fly through things. I know name is different, and that little gem is, is different for different cards. So I'm going to go over probably the generic aspects of the cards first in that one. But just more playlists. That is something that I've been focusing on. There's more playlists in the main page right now. And I'm trying to structure the channel so that new players or returning players both have something that would be interesting to them. And of course, the art of lore is open for everyone. I think it's important to have an entry point that's universal, that anyone can enjoy a good story. Anyone can laugh at the Goblin of Greed and his hijinks. Anyone can see Marauding Captain and root for him, or maybe root against him. I don't know. If you like the Invader of Darkness and you're rooting for him, good for you. Maybe your favorite character is Despair from the Dark, and you're rooting for Despair from the Dark. Okay, that's good too. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I do think that moving forward, there's going to be a little bit of restructuring, a little bit of shift in content, and just more effort on my part, more focus, and more specific things that I'm working towards. Of course, there's the podcast, but this is mostly to get ideas out for one thing, so that I can hear them later, so that my ideas are recorded. But more so, so that I can communicate to my audience what my intended plans are, and 
looking back, this might be fun for, for new players, for new channel affiliates to go back a few years and, and listen. Wow, this is how it all started. This was the plans. This was the structure. And that's why I sequester all the YouTube stuff to the last part so that you don't have to go back and listen to my abstract YouTube things. I try to keep the topics less topical and more evergreen, but that's hard. That's going to be a, a future consideration. That's why I chose the big topic of ban lists this time, because that's something that's probably always going to exist in card games. Now, I do want to make a note about influences and optimism for the future. I do have a couple, more than a couple, I watched an Ingus video, and I'm probably going to put a link in the description to it, but the core principle for those that don't have time or are just listening to this passively was he wants to use the medium of his videos to tell elaborate stories, to pace and structure and take the ideas and move them in the right direction. There's a sense of authorial intent based around the existing stories. He wants to, on one hand, elaborate upon what already exists and weave with his own unique style the structure of the game, his restrictions and his creativity. And that is really good. I like that. That was really motivating to hear just how he goes about his ideas. The second video I watched was from Cold Crash Productions, and it was the Chase Your Dreams commentary, where the part that I want to point out is don't just chase one dream. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, but go towards multiple dreams. And that's a little bit hard for me because don't want to dedicate too many time too much time to too many projects and burn out but I am working maybe 5 to 15 hours a week uh, as a soft limit for this and then dedicating 5 to 15 hours a week on other topics that you haven't seen and probably won't be featured on this channel and then 5 to 15 hours a week on on personal things and then obviously working part time uh, in addition to that but Choosing multiple dreams, that's something that I'd like to, to work on. And this channel is something, it's in the background, it's small. It's something that I'm enjoying doing, definitely. And I'm honing my skills. That's, that's one of the things that I really enjoy about the channel is it's directed objectives. And each video, I focus on what can I learn, what can I do, what improvements can I make, what new filters can I try out. What can I do to increase the quality of the video? The different rendering settings, different audio settings, different structure, change th uh, the presets, even learning minor things uh, across each new iteration. And of course, there's, there's natural improvements that happen too that are outside of my control, like Shotcut gets an update and suddenly things just work better, or there's new options to play around with, or I really enjoy one of the changes, and that's great. There is, in the back of my mind, an attempt to get, uh, it's hard to put a number on it, but 3 to 5% improvement on each video, and that's a rough number. And that's not to say that every video is better than the one preceding it, because I don't think that's possible. But I'm working to improve my script writing, my delivery, my focus on topics, my command of the English language, my diction, pronunciation, all, all of these things. And it is a little bit strenuous, but all the effort is, is coming together and is a weird polymath situation to be in where I'm the jack of all trades and structure, design, edit, produce, but it's fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And eventually I want to translate this skill set into something more universal. I do have plans that are going to influence this channel, but they're way far off. Those are game development of my own. And outside of that, probably other pursuits. There might be a crossover. I might talk about card games on another channel, but it will be a particular flavor that you're not well affiliated with yet. 
I mean, we brush around it a lot in the in the this channel, but to really experience it, I'm not sure my audience is ready for it, or perhaps I haven't attracted the people who are ready for it yet. But it's going to be an expansion of your understanding to be sure. But with that cliff note, I'm going to conclude the second TCGT cast. <laughs>